Janet Babb is with the U.S. Geological Survey. Do people in the surrounding communities have to worry about boulders falling on their homes? Uh, no, no, not at all, because the boulders will only be carried in the immediate vicinity of the vent. If there's an explosion, geologists say the largest rocks would land in this area. Marble-sized rocks could fall up to a half mile away, but still within the closed national park. The resulting ash cloud could be 20,000 feet high and blown across the island. Now here's what came out of the National Park Service to explain it to everybody. Water table, as long as it's saturated, that lava lake, the conduit, fine. It, that water is naturally repelled just due to the heat. It turns to steam. It can't go any further. But on the right, image number two, when the lava drains, water just pours in there. And at the same time, what happens is that conduit collapses in on itself. So what they're really looking for is the steam that's coming out and gases that are emerging at the moment, if they suddenly turn off, they know that the conduit has been plugged and it caved in on itself. From that point forward, they're not sure exactly how much time until this steam explosion will occur. But when it turns into this water flash steam plume explosion, they're talking about a once in a hundred year eclipsing something from 1924, if not equaling it. Ashfall is a nuisance, but it doesn't threaten life. It is in that moment of crisis when the world turns to us, it's looking to the USGS for information, it's looking to the USGS to help them understand and react to and respond to a disaster uh, that uh, we have to be there for them. Our networks have to be uh, up and running. Um, our uh, information has to be getting out uh, in order to make a difference. Ashfall is a nuisance but it doesn't threaten life. Hey, what's your name? Helen. That's nice. You look like a Helen. Helen, we're both in sales. Let me tell you why I suck as a sale. The pet is my possible sale. Oh, my pretty little pet. I love you. So I stroke it, and I pet it, and I massage it. Naughty. And then I take my naughty pet, and I go... <laughs>
And I keep talking about the silica rich. Really, what is silica? It's silicon and oxygen. Think of quartz crystals. It's about the simplest way to boil it down. Silica rich magma. Here's some images from below. You got the Philippines. Anywhere that you see Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, Philippines, Ring of Fire, specifically Asia, most of them are silica rich. So we have 169 active volcanoes in the U.S., about 88 of which could be potentially explosive in their eruption style. And because of that, even though they are located in uh, sometimes remote areas away from population centers, they can have the ability to send ash up to 20,000 and 30,000 feet where commercial air traffic flies. And the ash clouds from these volcanoes can potentially disrupt air traffic over a significant portion of you know, the U.S., contiguous U.S., as well as the northern hemisphere of the world. It is in that moment of crisis when the world turns to us, it's looking to the USGS for information, it's looking to the USGS to help them understand and react to and respond to a disaster uh, that uh, we have to be there for them. Our networks have to be uh, up and running. Um, our uh, information has to be getting out uh, in order to make a difference. So there are a number of consequences of a large explosive eruption in the lower 48 or even in you know, Alaska or uh, the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. And the long-term effects from such an eruption could be manifested for months to even years after the eruption. So it's essential then that we know what a volcano is capable of doing, and it's really crucial to be able to detect the unrest that are volcanoes in the earliest stages so that we can make effective actions that will protect society and reduce the risk. Uh, we have in the USGS five volcano observatories, the Alaska Volcano Observatory, we have the Cascades Volcano Observatory. We have uh, the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory. And we have the California Volcano Observatory. And then we have the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. The gap analysis is essentially the difference between what is currently on the volcano in a monitoring ground-based instrument sense versus what are the optimal number of and type of instruments that we'd like to have on the volcano given its past behavior and what we know about it, what we know about its past eruptions, what we know about the incidence of explosive eruptions at this particular volcano, the distribution of the products from those eruptions, and its proximity to population and infrastructure or air traffic. We have plans for a National Volcano Early Warning System. This is to build on our existing uh, monitoring capabilities, and not just monitoring, but also assessment and research capabilities, all of them leading towards uh, the capability to, uh, to warn uh, whenever there is an eruption in any one of the 169 active volcanoes that we have uh, here in the U.S. The National Volcano Early Warning System is a new plan to augment and modernize the monitoring networks that we have on volcanoes. And by monitoring networks, that includes instrumentation in the form of seismometers, video cameras, tilt meters, and ground deformation sensors, namely GPS instruments. And it's essential that we detect those early signs of activity as early as possible, such that we're not racing to catch up, but we're actually seeing the first signs of unrest at a volcano. That buys us time with which we can provide warning to communities at risk and uh, aviation uh, in, the, in the area.
the heart of our mission is public safety. The heart of our mission is seeing our information used. And that means uh, we absolutely rely on many different partnerships, uh, both within the government and outside the government, in order to achieve that end.